Okay, guys, it's been brought to my attention that the uh, Green Sahara Project genetics are finally out, and I'm going to share that with you shortly, but I want to clarify where we're at and kind of do my video to go along with it here. What we're looking at here is uh, Herodotus's ancient map, so we're looking at a, a time way before this, of course, but I just want to pinpoint a few things to you and where we're kind of at, I guess you'd say. Um, where we're at is probably right up in here, uh, probably at the N of Garamantes, maybe the T. Now, it used to all be called Libya. Later, it got named Africa after a general that came through there and stuff. But at this time, they thought that the uh, Nile came up here, and you see where it's Nilus. Nilus is the ancient river god where they have a connection with Egyptus and so on, and the Nilus river god of their ancient mythology. But they thought that it ran all the way over here to Atlantis, or the mountains of the Atlas Mountains, which is goes with Atlantis. And, I've done videos, and a lot of people have here recently, of the Eye of Sahara that runs here. And there's wadis and oasises that ran through here, and people made a lot of mention of those in a lot of ancient charts and uh, just tellings of where they went through, and some of them were quite secret. Now, there were also rivers that ran up through here, and it's kind of believed that Herodotus probably never made it past the first river here um, that used to run, and it's not really shown in here, but... Uh, there were quite a few running up through that time and other maps just shortly after like a Ptolemaic map let's look at that will show that here's Egypt and they had a giant oasis that they had pulled over here at the time so this is like the Mare Sea down here and this would have been another but if we look there's these oasises that run all the way through here and there's a place here that's named and uh, but you can't quite make it it just looks like it's spelled interior but in that interior of the turning to desert there was all this connected river work it seems at one time that was drying all up but there used to be rain through the Sahara and people have said oh that's back 10,000 years and like no no it's only about four or five where it was raining some nowhere near the point of being a superized green Sahara but you'll be able to see in some of these pictures I'll look at how it dried up away and where we're kind of looking at again I guess uh, this is twisted <laughs> a little odd but uh, where we're looking at again is probably maybe about where this oasis here is or maybe this one I don't know somewhere between these two it looks like it couldn't be this far deep but uh, a burial ground that's set through there, too, that they have found these bodies at. I did a video on it not too long ago, and we'll take a look at that. Now, what we're looking at here is cave art that's done in that area, and a cave that's become famous called Cave of the Swimmers. And it was at the start of the English patient, the movie, where the guy was looking at this art. People have gone there. And because this limestone flakes off fairly easily, it's been eroded real bad, uh, places of it like this are just totally missing, and they know something was there, and uh, probably another person diving. But uh, you can see these people diving out into the water and such, and uh, a lot of swimmers, and I recently did my video on uh, mermaids of the Green Sahara, and that is another cave that's hooked up along this network that's buried up under the sand now and pretty much the river system is all filled in but you can actually see it if you go on the Google Earth and find around where it is and you can see where it would fill in if you were to rain real hard there and it flooded it would all come through this one area if you took all that sand out it's quite a bit of people that probably lived in that area not on the river but just off the river and around that river at one time and this is just one place that we found of it let me show you some more of these pictures and we're going to go zooming in and out and I hope I don't freak you out whenever I do or so but we'll look at just some of this art that's found here and these people and these cows and this odd showing of maybe what looks like a north south east west depiction that's here that's going on let's see this Let's see if we can find another good one that we know is from there. Cave of the Swimmers. And again, here we have Cave of the Swimmers. And it seems like these people are standing here facing in, and these people are standing here facing in, and everybody's doing this procession through the center of it. It's what this kind of symbolizes. 
And I'm not going to get into all the symbology of everything onto it, but these people are wearing grass skirts, it seems. Other people aren't at all, so this must be maybe women and then men. And There's a woman over here with a grass skirt and a woman over here. It looks like they couldn't draw too good upside down yet. Mm. Well, there's other depictions, too, where these people don't look like they've got regular feet. But if you look, they've got these pod feet that they put onto them, these little pod, pod, pod kind of feet on them in a lot of these pictures and these red ochre which I've showed you in a lot of things goes back to Cro-Magnon burials and so on let's continue and look at a few more of these here's another picture of diving and swimming and uh, it's believed that pieces have flaked off somewhat but this is a half a body and another half a body here which is strange you can see these people jumping into the water and uh, Cave of the Swimmers Forum. This is one of the ones where they've taken and just darkened the hell out of it so it's no longer red ochre so you can really make depictions because some of these are just so light you can't even see it all but you just see a little touching. So they've darkened the hell out of this. And in this picture there's this giant yellow ochre god kind of thing. I don't know, just giant here. It's around and there's all these people that are around and people have said that's a dinosaur. That's a dinosaur. I'm more apt to thinking it's got to be a tuck-butted giraffe. But people have pulled off. This is back from the dinosaurs and so on. What they're not showing you here is the ass of what seems to be an elephant that they've drawn rather badly. Here's a lion in his mane, but it's mushed out. Here's a ram and so on. Anyhow, and you can see bows and arrows on some of these people and so on. Let's continue. another famous picture from there that you can see and it looks like they have purposely left out painting certain places and you can definitely see the hands on this guy so it's a little different but it's the same diving and swimming and going into the water that's going on here right and let's look at a different picture set here We just looked at every one of those but one. Uh, another picture that comes from there, and it shows a strange body form. Almost looks like it has a tail, or its leg is kicked out real weird, which is probably what it is. There's another person almost laying, it looks like it's laying down dead. And then this person here wearing a full robe, and he's got two ring things around his neck. Looks like the Egyptian ring neck kind of looking thing. And there's a body here without a head, and then another piece here. And what they're saying about this is this whole flake came off. Let's see if I can trace it. It came off right here, and there's a little bit of red there. So there was something else here, around and up, right through here, right through there. And almost a titch of color there. That There would have been a head. Looks kind of like that, like a bean. Anyhow, interesting. Let's look at some more before I go on. Is this going to be... No, this is Cave of the Archers. And which one is this? That's Cave of the Archers. That's a different one. We'll look at a few different ones of these at different times. I guess maybe let's go ahead and go to here. And we'll look at a multiple picture here that shows you kind of where we're looking at here. This is a couple of the sets of caves. What they're showing is this whole area was flooded here. And at the time, all these people used to swim around like crazy and dive and swim in the water whenever this was an oasis. In one of the most unlikely places you'd ever think of in the world, the Sahara Desert. But sure enough, smack dab in the middle is a cave. Here's one of them that's famous, and they're even looking up at the art that's there on the walls. It's all up in here and starting to flake off. And again, people have come here because of it. And these people here, they may have had, oh, 40 to 50 people look. And now they get more than that a day quite often. And people have messed it up. And some thrown rocks trying to knock off pieces so they can save some and things. They've put a barrier up here. So you can't quite do that anymore. And this whole area leads in... And this whole area was underwater. In fact, this etching that's shown here is as it went up and down, up and down, as it dried away, 
kept making different lines and those lines and the wash lines along the walls made this etching but at one time it was all the way up to here in fact you can see a good gouging where it's all the way up to here so there would have been islands in the middle of a giant lake and these look like rounded off river pebbles quite a bit cave of the swimmers Gibble Kabir Plateau. Here's where somebody's drawn a better depiction of it, stronger, just like they're drawing on paper. A long time ago, this is on a piece of thick paper drawn from a long time ago, and these dancers, and there's a hand that they did not draw that I believe in this picture is right here. You might even be able to have that shot right there. Again, you see these people jumping and diving in the water. We don't really see any swimmers, and it's Cave of the Swimmers. What's up with that swimming thing? Well, there are caves of these swimmers, these people that are swimming. Again, I'm going to show you this land here. I just saw a thing from my video on Green Sahara. We'll look at that in just a second. You see these little people in here, and how this whole area was flooded underwater. And you can see the etch mark that's right here that this thing would not have been even an opened up cave and as it opened up and then became a water level that seemed to sustain at about this level for some time going up and down up and down etching into it and then finally wasted away and as it did the people seemed to leave this oasis but uh, it also carved a hole in the back and they need to get a permit here to dig out some of these places and see if there is any bodies there but they've also found on higher ground spots full graveyard things and I will show that to you in a second but uh yeah there's my my video set for mermaids of the green Sahara that I did and in these caves they show you pictures of these things that look like sharks or perhaps swordfish and people look like they're hanging on to giant whales and right here behind the word green is a white whale and there's its tail like a Moby Dick thing and all these people going around and some of them have spade tails on them and they look like mermaids yeah so tails of mermaids and stuff we kind of went into that so I don't necessarily need to go that so much but then again I want to show you some more of that I guess uh, let, let you see what we're looking at and where this place is exactly ah there's my mermaids of green Sahara again uh, Cave of the Swimmers is also like a heavy metal band now for some some reason they picked that up um, those are the same pictures we looked at earlier I'm looking for a few specialized ones and I want to show you where we're at and there's a lot of rock art that's all over there and of course I think we can identify these as giraffes in the same area we're talking about not from there and somebody can tell that this too is a giraffe and then what looks like a camel but I think it's just incredibly done wrong the symbolism that's here too with the side looking C and then what's a cross what is a snake these ideograms that are on here from ancient times from proto writing and stuff and cows blotchy looking cows people standing behind blotchy looking cows let's continue oh so the English patient this is like the opening shot from that you know where the guys tracing it out and redoing it here he's doing one of the famous scenes where he puts his hand in the mark and he's trying to decipher things and stuff I don't know if y'all have ever watched or seen it but yeah we're getting there we're getting there where are we at okay let's show you where we're at so now people know modern names of everything and we're over here in Libya and like yeah that probably is about where I was talking about or I don't know that that what I'm talking about almost looks like it comes out to here maybe 50 hundred more miles southern of there but then again that's kind of a terrible depiction of that it's right over here in, in the edge of Niger and where we're looking at it, the oasis line kind of runs almost through here with little fingers that spread off of it, right? It's almost on that borderline, if you will. And uh, I think that is where it's at. 
So now let's uh, take one more look at this terrible washed out pick of a terrible washed out wall. This is like one of the ones that they darken real bad and give a contrast to over and over again and then try to pull it out of it. But here we have that giant elephant type creature. The yellow guy is standing right in here. There's all those people that are all around. And this is a, a huge effigy. Uh, someone stands six foot tall. I don't even know where the ground is here. But uh, you can see they go all the way down here too. Handprints, everything, all over this thing. And uh, a lot of people uh, would have been in there. And what these people do is they try to recreate the movie scene from the English patient. And they've gone out there and caused a lot of problems. Here's just one picture of this mermaids and the whale. That's the white whale. That's the red ochre and the red ochre mermaids here that are swimming around. Right? And you can see the spade tails they have on them. And so kind of neat. Um, here's a dog that won't quit doing the ironing for the house so she had to unplug the iron. I, I thought that was incredible. Maybe I'll do a video on that. So you can see these guys pulling up to this place. And there were some pictures of some caves that look very similar to this with people in water. And I want to give you an idea what this area looked like. You can almost see it's washed out from there. But you can see that line running through here too and up through here. And it looked like at one time it may have been as high as up in here. Really stayed there stagnant. Stayed stagnant back down to about here. And then worked its way up and down, up and down, eating this up. And uh, that's pretty much what it would have looked like back in the day. As they were starting to do this art and then finishing it off from there. And uh, so quite a difference from what we would think of as being the Sahara. You know, these people swimming around in here like crazy, jumping around and getting in the water. And uh, just having a good old time. Here's a view back from the cave looking here. And I think this is kind of telling. I showed this in one of my other shots. That you're in the edge of the cave looking back. And this whole thing was underwater. To about this level right here for a while. And then it came down to right in here. Right in here. And you can see that line that's around here. And it rode for a long time came down lower and at one time this was a little peninsula and it would have only been five six foot deep or how much of this sand is covering up stuff that's from a long long time ago uh, we need to look into this again here's one more depiction of this giant mound that's there that I'm not sure if they've even climbed all over it and saw if they found more glyphs surely someone has but to show you the size of this that's the work truck and there are about eight people standing in there if you can barely make it out. Let me zoom in. Yeah, even though it's a terrible picture of the grain, it's just as I'm zoomed in so much. Okay, so let me give you a little clip of the piece that I saw and then we'll go for the genetic data. How about that one? So here's the one that I did, it was Skeletons in Niger, and it's way down in the edge of actually Niger down there where we were looking at just a minute ago. So down on that little tongue that comes down, and what they found is there's two groups of people that are there, and it's down here. And uh, this uh, famous archaeologist that really is made for dinosaur bones and trying to find them here, like they do in the Gobi Desert and like they do in the desert southwest of Montana and so on, tried to come through here and uh, found a population of ancient people. And where we're looking at in the genetic data, by the way, is just on the other side of this ridge. Uh, no, no, no. It's right over here. Right over here. This would have been pretty much where it is, right in here somewhere. And there's a river that runs right through here and out. And there's a river that runs right through here and here and out. And there's a river up here. And you no longer see it anymore, but there's kind of that blend that runs right through here and off of these higher grounds that would have made it. And even through here at one time, having a, a pool, which we would call today a giant lake, by the way, and another giant lake they found over in here 
for if any of this was underwater and this is lower over here this would have all filled in and such but uh yeah so uh this is tenarians and the kiffian culture that's there that they found and this is tenere in niger pretty much about the middle part of it and uh they had found burial mounds almost looked like little little mustaba little burial mounds like you find in american southwest or so on and in this area it all flattened back down and what we're looking at here is a culture of them over here that's a raised mound area and then over here another set and a group of them and you can see the structure that's around and so on and hey there's this cattle guy over here that set up his house not too far from there huh anyhow it's pretty neat and so I was waiting for the genetic data to come out about this and uh, it finally has and seven Phoenician seven did one of her incredible videos which actually shows the fact and so we're gonna take a look at that and I won't be able to play the music but I'll say it along with it how about that ancestral mitochondrial in lineage from the Neolithic Neolithic Green Sahara if I can speak you can see the doctors that are hooked up along with this and they were looking at genetic data from these people they talk about here we present present newly obtained mitochondrial genomes from two 7,000 year old individuals from Tarkar Kori rock shelter in Libya representing the earliest and first genetic data for the Sahara region the green Sahara region these individuals carry a novel mutation motif linked to the haplogroup in root our results demonstrate that the presence of an ancestral lineage of the in haplogroup in the Holocene green Sahara associated to a middle pastoral Neolithic context so where's that leading? Well, where's that at? I'll tell you about early pastoral communities. The DNA analysis focuses on two individuals of the middle pastoral age who present signs of natural mummification from the ground and that dehydration being on those mounds. And then they give you these things. The samples are directly radiocarbon dated to 6,090 give or take 60 years before present right 7.1 KYA and 6797 to 7159 before present with a 95.4 percent probability and then they have the little range there 70 years and another one at 5600 give or take 70 years respectively both belonging to adult females And in haplogroups, which lie at the base of Eurasian mtDNA diversity, are today globally distributed outside of Africa and are dated to around 50 to 65,000 years ago, very close to the ancestral L clad. Their divergence from it is commonly considered to have occurred outside of Africa. Or during the expansion, the Arabian Peninsula represents a possible area where this recurred and a cradle from which the new branches spread towards Eurasia and back into Africa, including N1A and ROA, both of which are found in East Africa. So they're making correlations and connections. I tell you, it falls into the context of the uh, interstadial expansion. The an analyzed samples dated to 7,000 years before the present could represent a signal of a mitochondrial lineage that later disappeared because of genetic drift due to population contraction isolation with the beginning of desertification or migration. A possible scenario envisages a integration from Eurasia 
in ancient times that carried haplotypes that have since disappeared from Africa. The timing of this migration remains difficult to ascertain. So, Eurasian, or it matches up to ancient Eurasians, and uh, the timing of this migration remains difficult to define. The late Pleistocene dispersal from Western Asia into Africa around 39 to 52,000 years ago is suggested by the expansion of the U6 haplogroup with a potential corresponding archaeological signature in the MSA Dabin industry of Cyrenaceae, and this is uh, edging up to the Mediterranean in Libya, circa 45 to 40,000 years ago. Individual carrying individuals carrying a N haplogroup basal lineage could have followed the same dispersion pattern as U6. Their legacy could have been survived up to 7,000 years ago in the central Sahara. Thanks to the climatic conditions prescribed, and they're telling you that, like, like some of the mummies, it kind of helped them uh, to stay naturally mummified. Genomic data for seven 15,000-year-old people, they compare it to in some of these others. And so they're going over a wide swath and telling you these are people that are from like this and this before and in other parts of North Africa that they were comparing them to. Genomic data for seven 15,000-year-old individuals attributed to the Ibero-Morasian culture in Teferalt or Morocco suggest a connection with the Epipaleolithic Natufians from Near East that are around in the Levant area and uh, where we would call Cain. It is known that livestock was introduced from Southwest Asia and early pastoralist connections between Northeast Africa and Arabia are indicated by a few sites along the Red Sea with sheep and goats dated to eight to seven and a half thousand years ago and so, so it tells you, along with the goats and sheep, thus the spread of pastoralism comes into the area. And they've known for a long time the genetics of those animals, the sheep, the goats, the bulls and cows that they have that are there. The grains and emmer wheats and barley and grains come from Sumeria and Upper Anatolia, where these early Neolithic farmers had actually come from and expanded back down into North Africa which already blended with a Caucasian population, was all around the whole Mediterranean, all the way through North Africa, like they're talking about. And as we looked at the Herodotus's map at the very first there, you can tell they didn't even really know Sub-Saharan Africa existed. The, the, the desert went into the abyss. It's pretty much, that was it. But uh, not too many thousand years before that, these people knew what was down there, and there was more Caucasians too. You can find the Hofmeyer site shows you down in the Cape at 40,000 years ago. Uh, people that are definitely not looking Khoisan. Let's continue here. With, uh, thus the spread of that pastoralism from the Levant to Northeast Africa could possibly represent the context for the integration of the N haplogroup to the Central Sahara. Even if it's commonly associated with derivative lineages in one. So they're definitely making the connection with these early Levantine people and the Tufians, which seem to have had a lot more to do with things than we originally envisioned or pulled out of data. I think that we're going to find out that what we've been doing is ruining things by naming things, people. Sometimes a name will not fit. And because you've given a name to people over here and a name to people over there, or a name for certain things, is it possible that if we renamed an atom as thinking it of being the smallest part and called it something else, that we might have a new vision on the actual article itself? Some of the words that we use for things may be holding us back, and they're archaic words that we still use for things. And it's possibly the meanings that are attached and so on to a lot of these things that cause us some problems. And it has to do with vernacular somewhat. But And there's so many slangs that if you step back and look at it, 
like I just said there, it doesn't uh, make as much sense unless you're part of that vernacular. Anyhow, let's continue. When the geometric morphometric analysis of the skull of TKRSH1 is compared with a large published data set, it shows closer affinities with the sub-Saharan contest, such as Guy Barrow and in Niger, whose occupation dated from 9.6 to 4.8 thousand years ago. So, they look at this, and they can find way down in Gobero, Niger, right, that that's there. And she points out who resided in Gobero, Niger, then. The genetic impact of Lake Chad Basin population in Africa is determined by mitochondrial diversity and, inter and uh, internal variation of L3E5 haplogroups. They'll tell you that the prehistoric site of Gobero, Sereno, and others back in 2008 found recently in central Niger near a paleo lake on the western tip of the Tanare Desert being what we were just looking at, many skeletal remains have been unearthed here, and the oldest occupation of the site is dated to the early High Holocene, 9.7 thousand to 8.2 thousand years ago. Craniometrical data gathered at the site reveal great similarity in this original population to the so-called mectoids from Mali and Mauritania, as well as the Ibomerasians and Capsians from Maghreb providing particularly confirm confirmation of early Holocene Trans-Saharan connections. The settlement then experienced a hiatus until different human populations showed up. But he talks about mectoids. So there, it gives you a little bit of insight as to who might have been there at that point in time. Again, the genetic data is pulled from seven Phoenician 7. Gotta love her end art there. Like, share, and subscribe, guys, and enjoy. Peace.